How's everyone doing today? Good? Good. <laughs> um, welcome to those of you who are new here today. Um, it's lovely to see, see you here. Um, often we have negative media campaign and then we have more new people come along. Um, so it seems to be related somehow. <laughs> um, We'll probably want to do just a little bit of housekeeping stuff first. All right. Um, well, today's session is the session is a continuance of a sessions that we've been running recently about human relationships. We're doing two series of uh, sessions lately. One series of sessions is about a relationships with God, or relationship with God, and the other series of sessions have been about human relationships. And this is a continuance of the human relationship session. And we've been looking at the world's definition of love versus God's definition of love. So we've been comparing the two definitions of love. So for those of you who have missed out on the previous two sessions, they are both uploadable or downloadable or viewable on YouTube. So they're both already present there. They are uh, four-hour sessions each. So that's a lot of listening to catch up, uh, eight hours of catching up. But the world's definition of love, we began as a discussion in Melbourne a few months ago when we were down in Melbourne. And then what we did um, last, I think it was about a fortnight ago, I think, yes, we did the second talk, series number two of the world's definition of love. And today is the third in a series of four about the world's definition of love. So it's not the final session of this group of this group of material. Now the reason why we've been focusing on the world's definition of love is because most of the time the world believes it knows what love is and it believes it knows what love does and it believes it knows what love feels like. So if I just write those three things down, the world, and by the world I mean just everybody in the world generally. So one, it believes it knows what love is. Number two is it believes it knows what love does and it believes it knows what love feels like. Now logically if that was true the world should be a completely loving place and there should be no war, no, only peace, no human suffering, only kindness, compassion, understanding and everything else related to love. So while we believe we know what love is, what love does and what love feels like, it's obviously, obviously the case that we mustn't know because if we did know completely what it was, then the whole world would be cured of all of the ills that are unloving. Does that make sense to you from a logical perspective? So from a logical perspective, although the world believes that to be true, it can't be true. There has to be something else going on. Because for it to believe that to be true, the world would be a very, very different place. If this was actually true, the world we'd be living in, we'd be experiencing love on a day-to-day -day basis, None of us would be ever stressed out in our lives. None of us would have any fear in our lives at all. None of us would have a worry about safety, security. None of us would be concerned about war. None of us would be concerned about not having enough to eat, not having enough to drink, not having enough to wear, not knowing where you're going to live. And none of those things would be a problem because all of them would automatically be sorted out because all of us are automatically loving. And so therefore nobody would ever miss out. There wouldn't be millions and millions of children dying every year from starvation and malnutrition, if that was true, if we all knew. 
There wouldn't be any religious turmoil. There wouldn't be any attacks or fights between different religious groups because all of them would know what love is and love does and so therefore there wouldn't be any fighting between them. Does that make sense to everyone? Logically, you can see that if this was true, the results would be very different to the results we have. Now, if the results we have are very different, in other words, the results we have are there are 50 million or so children dying every year from malnutrition. That's the reality. There are wars on the planet all the time. In fact, some wars are bigger in terms of the amount of ordnance dropped on people than the Second World War. And that still happens today. So these, there is a lack of peace and security for the majority of people on the planet. When you, when you, when you analyse security from the perspective of having everything you need to eat, drink, clothing, food, shelter and so forth, even if you just treat those basic human necessities, there are a good one third of this planet that don't get those basic human necessities for life. And for how could they ever then have an enjoyable life? It's not possible. So the fact that we believe we know what love does and we believe we know what love is and we believe we know what love feels like, we have to, as a human race, start taking responsibility for the fact that we mustn't know what love does and we mustn't know what love is and we mustn't know what love feels like yet because if we did, as a human race, there would be no problems on the planet at all. We could all have differing opinions and we would all live together in peace and harmony. So we might be of a different religious faith, some might be Muslims, some might be Christians, some might be Hindus, some might be Buddhists, some might be atheists, some might be agnostics, but they'd all get along in love if we knew what love is. Does that make sense to everyone? And if it's the same with our politics. You know, there might be communists, socialists, Democ Democrats, Republicans, and so forth, all these different these different political parties, and they would all get along in love as well. And then we would also notice things like in a schoolyard, for example, all the children would get along in love. And then in society as a whole, all of us would get along in love if we knew what love is and what love does. So it, it is obvious then, or it should be obvious to us from that analogy, that we don't really know what love is, and we don't really know what love does, and we don't really know what love feels like. Because as a human race, if we did, things would be very, very different on the planet than they currently are. And this is whether you take God into an equation or not. So this is imm it's immaterial whether God exists or does not exist with this particular discussion in the sense that whether God exists or not, if we knew what love is, we would all get along even if some of us believed in God and some of us didn't. That's the reality too, if we understood what love was. And this is why the discussion about love is so important. Now, the world's definition of love has, remember in our last discussion, I said, and this is just a bit of a reminder about some of our last points of discussion, the world's definition of love entered us through a process. Do you remember the process that I described the last session? The process was this. Because of the amount of fear the world's already in, so here's our soul, let's just draw it as a ball, that's our own personal soul. Because of the amount of fear the world is in as a whole, most of us individually are also carrying a lot of fear as a result. Now because we are carrying a lot of fear as a, as a result, our soul becomes open to, in other words, there's, you could think of it as vortexes into our soul. Our soul becomes open to beliefs that are fear-based. You see, if I have fear in the soul, and this fear enters us at the moment we become attached to a human body, the fear starts entering us from our environment. The world environment is in a lot of fear. And our own parents generally are in a lot of fear. 
most of them are even in a lot of fear about having a child. <laughs> you remember the very first child you had? How did that feel like? Well, for most of us, it was like, whoa, this is a, this is a pretty unique situation. And for the first time in our life, we often have quite a lot of fear as a result. And um, this, fear, this fear that's in us enters the child. It enters the child and therefore makes the child open to fear-based belief systems that come from the world or the environment in which it lives. So, if we have one fear-based belief system, so example, if we have a fear of authority, then the fear-based belief system is that we've got to be concerned about authority, we worry about authority and how much we might get attacked by authority. And then if we start applying that to the idea of a god, we will start feeling that God's like authority on earth where you'll get punished if you do the wrong thing and you get rewarded if you do the right thing, although there doesn't seem to be so many rewards nowadays <laughs> about doing the right thing, but uh, nevertheless, that's the general, you know, the carrot and the stick type principle. That's normally what's going on for us. And so we start applying the fear-based beliefs that our soul is now susceptible to, it's open to, um, to even our relationship with God, but in particular to our human relationships. We start applying fear-based beliefs into our relationships with everyone around us. That's what finishes up happening. And so our soul then, because there's this fear in the soul, it only feels right when somebody presents us a fear-based belief. And if somebody presented to us a love-based belief, we then think it's wrong. And we automatically start to have a tendency of rejecting it because, because it's not resonant with what our internal feelings are. And that is, no, no, that's not true. So if somebody said, to, somebody said you could go across to, the front, to a, to a war-based front and walk down in front of everybody shooting each other and you'll be fine. If they said that to you, most of us would go, yeah, I don't think so, mate. You know, like, that's definitely not the case. You know, sooner or later you're going to get caught in that. Most of us would have that feeling. And so most of us then would have a level of fear being placed into that situation. A situation where we could be potentially harmed or even killed. And we have a level of fear that's based on that particular situation. Now, that level of fear means that when I examine that situation, I am going to examine that situation through my fear. And unfortunately, then apply that same fear-based examination to other situations in my life. So while, for many of us, the original time that fear entered us was a valid event, what we finish up doing is we start applying that fear to other events that are not as valid. Does everyone understand what I'm saying about that? So for example, if my father... Uh, left me as a child and left me alone with my mum and my siblings and I never had a father the rest of my life, if I hold on to that feeling inside of me without having it change, then what will finish up happening is if I'm a woman, I'll attract men into my life but then I'll be afraid that they'll leave. I'm now applying the fact that my father left when I was a child to a new situation, to a, to, a, to a relationship. And this is where human relationships are often distorted because of all the unhealed baggage that we carry around inside of us that then motivates us to apply the same baggage to a new situation. And unfortunately, these fear-based beliefs, some of which are personal, so if I could just, just draw another little vortex entering us here, some of which are personal, in other words, related to our childhood in particular and how we were at, and some of which we, I would call environmental. In other words, related to the environment in which we environment in which we live. These fear-based beliefs have now entered us, and they now start dictating to us our life. They now start manipulating the way in which we act and think and feel in our life. 
because we haven't yet released them from of old. And these personal belief systems relating usually to my childhood, the environmental belief systems relating to how I was brought up in the environment, what happened at school and so forth, and they make us then open to other fear-based belief systems entering our soul. So we become firmly convinced that certain things that are, that are not true from God's perspective are actually true from our perspective. Now, to give you an example in my own life, if you had seen me around uh, 15 years ago, I, would have, I, w I was at that time completely convinced that God was a God of wrath. Completely convinced. All right. In fact, I've spoken to audiences in that state, more than 5,000 people in that conviction. All right. Now today, I am completely convinced about the opposite of that. So what made me completely convinced about that being true? Well, what was made me completely convinced is the fear-based belief systems of the world being absorbed in my soul and that then allowed me to accept this other fear-based belief system that God is a God of wrath, a God of punishment, who will punish the wicked and reward the righteous. But as I worked through these fear-based belief systems, and the way it happened for me was that um, I went through a period in my life where everyone in my life didn't want to see me anymore. And the funny thing about it is I still wanted to see them. <laughs> and I thought about that for a bit in terms of how that applied to God. Even my own sons didn't want to see me anymore for about a year and a half. And I applied that to my own relationship with God and said, all right, no matter what those other people do, and no matter that they don't want to see me or not, I still want to see them. I still want to have a relationship with them. I don't feel resentful of them. I don't feel vindictive towards them, even though many of them were attacking me at the time. And so then I started to realise, if that's how I am, then God must surely be better than that. God must be a better person or a better being than I am. So if that's the case, then surely God must have this feeling, even if everyone on earth doesn't want to worship God, doesn't want to know anything about God, God must still have a feeling that he wants to know them. If that's how I am, then surely God's better. And then I started working through the emotional reasons why I had come to accept this fear-based belief that God was a God of wrath. And there were quite a lot of emotions I had to let go of. One emotion was my own personal fear of torture and harm. I had to get rid of that. I had to release that. And that took a lot of uh, shaking and crying and going through a process, an emotional process. And once I come out at the end of that, I no longer felt anymore that God was a God of wrath. In fact, I feel completely the opposite than I did 15 years ago on that one subject. Now, that being the case, that tells us that it's possible to also release fear-based systems and confront them. And it's possible to actually absorb new belief systems, but only when inside of our soul, inside of our emotions and inside of our feelings and inside of our thoughts, inside of all of that, the sum total of who we are, inside of our soul, there must be a way to get rid of our susceptibility to fear-based belief systems and instead absorb love-based belief systems. And the reality is for the whole of human race, unless we do this, we cannot become loving. Unless we, as a human race, absorb love-based belief systems into our feelings and start rejecting fear-based belief systems in our own feelings, unless that transformation occurs, it's not going to be possible for us as humans to become more loving, to, be, to make the next step or the next leap in evolution, if you like. Which is, instead of being warrior-like, becoming peaceful. Having the ability to live together in harmony and peace and joy and love without there being constant strife, constant political, physical, um, war-based national strife, but also religious and other types of strife. None of, all of those kinds of strife would all disappear. And that doesn't mean that we wouldn't be able to have a good debate with somebody 
about something that we disagree on. But we just wouldn't be angry about it anymore because we know how to love now. So we could, we could, discuss, about our, we could discuss our differences in opinion without being upset and without feeling attacking and without resorting to personal libel and resor without resorting to persecution. And if you look historically, what mankind has done has resorted to even torture and abuse in order to perpetrate a different belief system. If you look at uh, many of the religious crusades in the past, right the way through the Dark Ages, the whole purpose was to put upon a whole group of people, a nation, a new belief system. And if they didn't accept it voluntarily, how did they have to accept it? Through violence. And that's what we've done in the past. Now, if we loved, I'm putting to you that that would never occur. And it could never occur. If we have learned how to love, that would never happen. You and I could have a completely different belief system and we'd be perfectly happy with each other about it. We'd even be able to still provide food for each other, we'd be able to provide shelter for each other, we'd give each other a drink if we need a drink, we'd be, able to, we'd be able to help each other build our houses, even though I might be an atheist and you might be a Pentecostal and somebody else might be a Muslim and somebody else might be a Hindu, we'd all be able to cooperate together. And so, and that cooperation comes about because we've all learned how to love. So the world's definition of love is very important for us to understand. As to the, you could say, the problems with the world's definition of love in comparison to what love really must be. Because the world's definition of love has given us the world we currently have. So that tells me our definition of love needs to change either individually, initially, and collectively. It has to change. Once our definition of love changes and it becomes more loving, the result of that definition changing will also then become more loving. That would naturally make sense, would it not? So we would actually finish up with a more loving environment if our own definition of love was more loving and the world's definition of love was more loving. So what we want to do today, and what we've been doing in some of these sessions, is we've been talking about some of the world's definitions of love and then comparing it with what must be the truth about love. And we're trying to apply some logic to the whole process as well, but also apply some of our feelings to the entire process. All right? So let's, uh, we're, now for those of you who haven't seen these presentations before, this particular series, um, in the previous two series we've mentioned a whole number of definitions of love that the world has and then what we've done is we've compared that definition of love to what must be God's definition of love or at least the definition of love we need to accept if everything's going to change. And so what I want to do is continue that with you today, pre presenting some new ideas about love, if you like, um, and compare what the world thinks about it to what I believe God's truth is about love. And also what I believe, because if we accept this God's truth about love, what I believe will happen in terms of the transformational effects that will occur on the earth as a result. So let's uh, start by bringing up one, the world's definition of love is that love is whimsical. Is that how you spell that? Whimsical? Yes. And uh, what would you say? Illogical. Illogical. In other words, when you're in love, you do crazy things that make no logical sense. That's the world's definition of love. How many songs are there about that one? Quite a number, huh? Okay. I must disagree completely with that. My feelings are, in fact, the ob ob opposite, and that is that love is completely, at all times, logical. 
Love all make, always makes logical sense. Now, let me give you some examples. One I wanted to give you was from the Bible, actually. So I'm just going to get out my Bible. Um, and You have heard that it was said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You've heard that? Okay. Now, uh, Gandhi made some comments about that. Do you remember what he said? Eye for eye leaves the whole world blind. Because in the end, we're going to sin against another person at some point. Jesus' words are, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn him to him the other cheek also. Now, I did actually say that. So, so that's a very different viewpoint, isn't it? Now, some would say that that viewpoint's whimsical, but it's not. It's actually logical. When you think about it, if, if you hit me and then I decide, well, that's pretty bad, so I'm going to hit you back, now both of us hurt, and then you decide that your hurt now wasn't justified, so you get out your knife and you go for me, try to stab me or something. So I get out my bazooka and try to blow you away. And you can see how things ha happen on the earth, don't you? It just escalates, escalates, escalates until we have now war. That's how things happen. Now, the logical thing to do is to never start that cycle. That would be the logical thing, wouldn't it? That would make logical sense. If somebody harms me, not to harm them back would be a logical choice. Because if I harm them back, there is a higher likelihood of them deciding now that they can harm me again and harm me in a more opposing manner. Now, it's also logical from the point of view of what I believe. It, now, if I believe there is an afterlife, then I'm not going to be tied up in this, oh, I've got to defend myself type thing. This life is all there is. If I believe that there is some kind of life after death, then I won't be worried about having to die in this life just because somebody attacked me and I don't want to get, attack them back. So our desire really, which, which is, and I'd put to you, love is logical with this particular desire, and that is, if I treat every person how I would like to be treated and not actually how they treat me, that would make much more sense. Now, you've all heard that before too, actually, many of you. Because that's called the golden rule in the Bible. In other words, that we allow, we, we treat others how we would like to be treated and not how they actually treat us. So, during the week, um, myself and Mary were attacked quite viciously by the media, right? So we have all of this, we have hundreds of emails coming to us. Uh, people who want to kill us and rape Mary and do all these other things, right? Because of what the media presented. Now, if I went then and did exactly the same as what they're doing, all I'm doing then is not logical. It's not a logical process to then attack them in return. Does that make sense? Because if I attack them in return, there's a higher likelihood, of course, now they'll attack me in return. And also, when you think about it, love does not attack. And if love does not attack, then I, if I'm attacking even as a form of defence, I'm out of harmony with love. Does that make sense to everyone? So, to me, love is completely logical in, in all situations and circumstances. It's even logical with regard to things like self-responsibility. You see, if I love, it makes logical sense that if I love myself, that I'd want to look after myself. That makes logical sense to me. If, if I don't love myself, then I'll start getting invested in other people looking after me. And to me, that doesn't make much logical sense. Because all of us have the ability, generally, if we are fairly sound in health, to be able to look after ourselves. Now, it also makes logical sense for me to help the people who aren't sound in health to look after themselves. That also makes complete logical sense. It doesn't matter whether they're of a different nationality, they have a different colour than I have, they have a, have a different belief system that I have. They, even if they're angry with me, I don't see how that makes any difference. It still makes logical sense 
to actually care for them as much as we're able. Love is logical, but the world's view of love is often very illogical. So the world's view of love is this. If somebody comes along and murders your son, then the best thing to do is to murder his son. That's the general viewpoint of the world, is it not? In other words, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Life for a life. My son's life for your son's life. My daughter's life for your daughter's life. Right? That's how we view it in the world, generally. Now, I'd put it to you that that's not love, even if it's considered to be love. Now, many of these parents who lose a child in a war-based situation and then feel justified in going attacking another child in another situation would, would say to you, it's because of the love of my daughter or son that I'm doing this. And I put to you that's not the case at all because the logical thing to do wouldn't be to exacerbate the problem by going and killing somebody else. That's not the logical thing to do. The logical thing to do is to forgive the person. That would be the logical thing to do because in the end we'll end up with no sons and daughters as if all of us finish up going to kill others who harm us and so forth. We'll end up with this terrible situation. Yeah. Joy and Mary, if, where are the mics by the way? The, oh yes, if we can come down, one down here and one across to Mary. Down there. Thank you. I just realised that as a society we've um, constructed this whole legal system mm -hmm. to carry that out for us. So there's yes. an expectation that we want them to do it for us and that makes us okay. That's correct. Um, we distance ourselves in society from the actual personal act. Mm. We've done this with, uh, with food even. We've done it, so in other words, with animals and being mm. loving towards animals. Mm. To distance ourselves from the fact that we're not being unloving, that we, we are being unloving towards animals, what we've done is we've go and get the animals killed by an abattoir and then we get a butcher to cut it all up for us and then we get it in a nice neat package that looks nothing like the original animal that was cut up and, and now we are emotionally distant from the act and we do this with government laws as well. We, we are trying constantly to emotionally distance ourselves from the underlying act. So this is where you see, say, for example, in the USA, in many states, there is still capital punishment where, you know, the death penalty applies. Now, that is done because of the rage of the individuals who are the victims of violence not being released, which means their sadness hasn't been released. So what they now do is they expect the government to take the reactional state, which is to kill the person who killed my son, daughter, wife, husband and so forth. And as a result of that, we have capital punishment being enacted by the government rather than by the individual. Myself and Mary watched an interesting movie last night which was all based on this premise of justice and... Uh, what was it called? Um, yeah, a law Abiding Citizen. Oh, Law Abiding Citizen. Have any of you seen that? It's a fairly violent movie, but um, it was about a man who didn't get justice and then the length that he went to in order to get justice for his family. And it was pretty, pretty intense at the end, the length he was going to, to get that justice. And yeah, what we try to do, Joy, is distance ourselves from the actual physical act and we create often a society that helps us to distance ourselves from the act. So, for example, uh, armies are about distancing ourselves from the act of violence. So, you know, we have certain people who are trained to go to war, but we're not all trained to go to war. We, we, we want certain people to go to war for us. And that's about distancing ourselves from the actual act of violence. If if we felt the act of violence, it's highly unlikely any of us would like to go to war. And if you talk to soldiers, most soldiers feel totally shocked and, ter that ter and feel quite strongly that war needs to be avoided at all costs, if you talk to the soldiers who have been to war. But, but the, the average human population doesn't believe that because we've all been distant emotionally from the process. Yeah. Mary? Uh, I was just feeling about this love is logical thing and you're sort of talking now again about love is justice, aren't you? Which is another thing that we spoke about in the mm. past. Yep. Um, but, but justice is, like to me, justice is not 
logical. That's, yep, sorry, I was talking Remember, about on the world's definition. Yeah, the world's love. definition that we've yes. discussed before was that love is justice. And, and God's definition is that love is not justice. Because there's many times God forgives us for things that... Yep, we're gone. Uh, I was just reflecting on how um, the diagram you, grew, you drew earlier and you were talking about how fear-based beliefs enter us because there's fear within us and I feel that's because we, they don't challenge the fear within us. The fear-based beliefs are resonant. Which that's I think correct, yep. So when a love-based belief comes along, it challenges the fear and usually triggers our fear. Very true. Um, which is why we resist it so strongly. Yep. I was just reflecting about the issue of logic, though, and it seems that the world has a fear-based definition of what logic is. Yes. <laughs> and um, that, that's tricky when you're talking about this subject because often when we have a love-based understanding of what's logical, it's challenging the fear-based definition inside of everyone. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. If we can even put it down to what happens in your kitchen... Because it, it's really Im impressive. If, if, you, you can, if you can look at your own actions in your day-to-day -day life, it becomes very interesting. Because often we believe certain steps are logical, but the reality is they're just fear-based decisions because we're afraid of challenging our mother or father's own way of doing things. And often we set up our kitchen. If you have a look at your kitchens, you might find this. We often set up our kitchen the way our mother would have set up the kitchen rather than in the most logical fashion. Because we're often got an emotion in play that we think it's logical, but once we start analysing it, it's not that logical. For example, we often... We live in Queensland, and particularly the more north you go, the hotter things are all through the year, yes? Pretty much warm all through the year. The logical thing would be to put our stove outside, wouldn't it? That would be the logical thing wouldn't it, for, most, for most people who live in Queensland. I wonder how many houses there are in Queensland that have the stove outside. There'd be some, but I don't think there'd be that many. And just even just basic things like that. Now, I'd say love of myself would mean that I wouldn't want to be working in a kitchen that's generating all this heat and I'm just sweating and having to put on an air conditioner and a fan or whatever in order just to stay cool while I'm cooking a meal, when the reality is that it could be just sitting outside and I could be cooking quite comfortably out there without having all this heat being dissipated in my home. That's just a logical thing. But it's also loving. Can you see how it's loving to yourself to not put yourself in a position that creates more discomfort? That's loving, not just logical. Yeah, and that's, that's what I have learnt about love, is that the way God created everything is very logical. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a process for everything and it's quite scientific, yeah. even our own body. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel like there is this uh, commonly held belief in society that, um, that, well, when you're in love you just do crazy things and it doesn't make any sense. And I feel that's because there's this fear belief that what you're spending all that money you know, which is basically a fear-based belief, not a loving one mm -hmm. that is affecting the way we judge what's logical and what's not. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I'm being very clear, but there's sort of... Yeah. I had well, a question when I started. And I was, well, even when you look at the titles, what was. Of, what was the question here, babe? Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you want to be oh, up here with me again? Or yeah. it, so? No, my question was about, um, is it fair to say that every... Every fear-based belief that enters us and every belief that enters us about love when we're in a state of fear is actually something that is placating our fear. Yes, So we believe always. love is its always going to be placating our fear yes. because we're resistive to it. So yes. this is what creates the world's definition of love. It's and that's one of the things we'll go through fear. later is how, yeah. how the world's definition of love is that love will placate my fear. Love will make me comfortable. Right? And God's view of love is very different to that. And it seems to me that all of the other definitions that we've had before are all actually related to fear anyway. All the, and all these are too. That's, that's what I mean. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. So, and this is something that we need to bear in mind is the world's definition of love isn't really love. It's just fear masked as love. 
a fear with a mask on it. That's what it is in the most cases. Whereas God's definition of love or the real love that we need to obtain whether we're involved with God or not is very fearless. There is no fear involved in the real definition of love. None at all. And we need to see this kind of definition. And one of the things myself and Mary often speak about is, is that it needs to enter our heart this new definition of love. It can't be just something we think about. It has to motivate our lives somehow. It's got to change us somehow. Because if it's just something we think about, when we get into a tough situation, we'll change our mind. Right? But if it's something that's a part of our system, something that's right inside of us, no matter how tough the situation, we will still do the loving thing. We will still act in the loving way. And it won't be something that changes our mind. We'll, we'll move on to that in a minute. So this love is logical thing is something that I feel many of us need to give more consideration to. Can I put to many of you ladies that you often criticise the logic of your husbands or partners. And yet, logic is an aspect of love. Isn't that an interesting concept? And often their logic... They're trying to present logic because they are actually in a more love-based thinking than you are with fear. You see, remember I've said to, to many of you how fear dominates many women's lives and grief dominates many men's lives. In other words, most men are afraid of grief. Most women are afraid of fear. Right? Most women cry quite easily. They're not afraid of grieving so much but they're very afraid of their fears. They, they get into this very, very locked up state. Now, logic is connected very strongly to truth. Logic and truth are often very strongly connected. And this is something we need to understand. What, what, is it, what is Raisin's theorem? Does anyone know what Raisin's theorem is? Come on, Luli, you know what Raisin's theorem is. Surely you do. It's a scientific... No? You don't? Okay. What, have any of you heard of it? No. no? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, it's a very basic premise that the simplest explanation is probably the truth. And the most logical explanation is the truth. Logic and truth are very connected with each other. Right? We need to understand this. Most, the most logical thing can often be, and the most simplest explanation can often be the truth. You know? You've got this guy standing in front of you calling himself Jesus. The most, he puts up a lot of crap about it. A logical explanation might be that it's the truth. That'd be simple. Now often we go into complexities, you see. We go, oh, no, no, surely he's crazy or he's this or he's that or he's nuts or he's a liar or whatever else and we want to justify all the alternatives. But, but sometimes the most logical, the most, the most simple thing is the truth. Now, this is in particular the case with our day-to-day -day life. Often the most simple explanation is the most logical and the most logical explanation is the most loving. That's often the case. Okay. Also tied in with this idea of logic is economy. It is logical and loving to practice economy. Now many of you practice economy because of fear of finances. Now, that's a different thing. That's not loving. But economy, in its pure sense, is loving. Everything God does is economical and therefore logical. Right? And because it's logical, also loving. Now, in regards to human relationships, which is our primary thing that we're looking at here, can you see if, if I criticise the logic of another person rather than examining the logic that they're presenting, can you see that that automatically prevents me from becoming more loving? Now, if you think about it in a relationship between, say, a man and a woman, a partnership or a, a, a husband and wife relationship, if the wife is criticising the husband's logic... and he, she's always saying, ''Oh, you're just being logical again.'' as if that's a problem, 
then there is an aspect of love involved there where the wife doesn't understand that love is logical. Now if the husband, as we've already covered in the previous talk, criticises the wife for being emotional, then there's also no love there. Because as we've talked about in a previous talk about love, love is always emotional. Because love is a feeling. It's not a thought. It's a feeling. And if love is always emotional, then how can we criticise the person who's being emotional? Now, it depends what emotion they're displaying, of course, doesn't it? If it's a loving-based emotion, or whether it's abuse or rage, which I, which I would say is not the real emotion that needs to be displayed anyway. So can we see how love is definitely logical? And therefore, and the world's definition of love is that love is crazy, illogical, doesn't make any sense, you go and do crazy things all the time. And the reality is that actually, if we're really in a state of love, we will probably never do something crazy, ever. Now, that doesn't mean the world wouldn't think it's crazy, by the way, because the world's definition of love is different. But... But from God's perspective, or from the truth's perspective, if we do things out of harmony with logic, then there's also a connection there to doing things out of harmony with love. Now, is there any questions about that particular subject? Joy, you'd like to raise something more? Um, just wait for that. Thanks. I'm just trying to put what you said together with what Mary said. Mm -hmm. So that if the man says something that's logical and it's probably the truth, but for the woman it's going to trigger her fear, so it's not going to make her feel good and therefore she's going to reject it? Exactly. Is that she, right? will, she will definitely reject it okay. and get angry with him and she, he's not looking after her anymore and he's not providing security anymore and he's not making her feel safe anymore. And there might because be lots love of should make her feel good. Is well, that's right? her, feeling, her feeling, but remember, we've also covered that. Yeah. Love doesn't always make you feel good. Right? So that, that's, a, that's, again, a false belief. Because if love, can, love will always confront a fear, and when we're confronting fears, we don't always feel good. That's the reality. So, so love doesn't always make us feel good, but love will, in the end, make us feel good. Once we've released the fear, in the end, we will feel good. But in, in the interim there will be some changes required. In regards to the love is not logical, if you deliver a truth in an unloving way, then obviously it's um, not really a truth. However, would delivering a truth be justice? Well, firstly, let me... Your, your first comment, the truth is always the truth no matter how it's delivered. However, if it's delivered lovingly, it will have a far more powerful effect than if it's delivered in any other way. All right? so, so I would argue that if somebody's telling you the truth, no matter how they're telling you, whether they're angry or upset with you, in a rage with you, or they're nice and calm and peaceful and relaxed, either way, you should listen to it for your own benefit, because it's the truth. But... Um, love itself would probably dictate delivering the truth in a calm and peaceful manner, certainly. Yep. Now, your second question was, take part of the question. Is truth justice? Um, I don't feel so, no. Because, because we can state the truth about something. Um, if I can give you an illustration. It is, it is just for me to state the truth about your childhood, is it not? But to state the truth about your childhood, I would have to know the complete truth myself about your childhood, which means I'd have to know the motivations of your mother, the motivations of your father, their underlying emotional injuries and what caused them to took the, take the actions that they took and so forth. So, so while it's just for me to state the truth, maybe one of the truths is Elaine, you were not loved when you were little. That might be a truth. And it's just for me to state that truth. It's also loving for me to state that truth. It's not loving for me to judge it. 
You see, and there's the big difference there. Now, most of the time when we get involved with stating truth, we are previously or already in a state, a state of judgment. Right? So, for example, I get asked lots of questions about how I can state that I'm Jesus. Right? Now, they're not normally asked as questions. They're normally... Like, so when I say they're not... The, the direct question is not normally asked. How can you believe you're Jesus when you're still wearing glasses? Is the question. Right? Right. The statement is often made, he's still wearing glasses, he can't be Jesus. That's the statement. And it's also a judgment and it betrays no knowledge as well. Whereas the question is, how can you be wearing glasses and say that you're Jesus? That's a valid question, is it not? I would ask, how can you be Elaine and still be wearing glasses? Wouldn't that also be a valid question? If, if you're asking Jesus the question, then surely me asking, how can you be Elaine and still be wearing glasses is also a valid question. It's not a very logical question, perhaps. but <laughs> <laughs> And Elaine does wear glasses. So, so obviously there's a hidden judgment in the question. And the judgment is, Jesus would not be wearing glasses. So they've already made up their mind. So it's not a question. It's now a statement. And it's also a judgment and therefore unloving. Right. Now, people think that it makes logical sense that Jesus should not be wearing glasses. Right. And I can certainly understand that particular train of logic, but it doesn't take into account all the factors. And one of those factors might be that Jesus chose to actually go through certain things. You know, there's also all those other factors. So can you see that often we ask questions or make statements of truth what we, from a point of what we believe is truth without having really a completely open mind about the subject at all. That's generally the case. And we do that because we have fears. So what is a fear of a person asking Jesus whether, why he's still wearing glasses? Well, you could list quite a lot of fears. If Jesus is wearing glasses, then he's just a man. But I believe Jesus is God. So therefore, my belief is going to be confronted if I see that Jesus is just a man. So it's fair, better for me to assume that Jesus is not a man and therefore must be perfect in his body right at this point in time rather than be imperfect in any way. And all of a sudden, now we have emotions that are illogical getting involved in the analysis of the question. And now what's happening is my previous belief systems, whatever they are, are now tailoring and colouring my investigation of truth. And that is where we go wrong as a human race. We, we colour everything based on previous belief systems that have yet to be established, but are only beliefs that are yet to even be proven to be logical in many cases. Right? And this is something we need to stop doing as a human race and start being far more open open to everybody's beliefs and questions. Now, if I have judgment about you, I will often ask a question, but really it's not a question, it's a statement of my judgment. Right? And that is an unloving thing that I would do and also quite harmful to my future development because I'm already coming from a point of view that I already know. And if I'm coming from the point of view that I already know, then I've already made up my mind and it's pointless asking the question. I'd be better off saying, I've already made up my mind, this is what I feel, see you later. And, and if I was loving, I would do that without trying to pester the other person. I'd say, sorry, don't believe you, that's okay, no worries, do you want to have a cuppa? <laughs> right? In other words, we would still be able to be loving to the individual that we disagree with. Yep. Okay. Let's look at another one. The world's view of love. Love allows abuse. We see this happening over and over again with many of the, our friends where their families are saying to them things like, I love you so I have the right to yell at you. But yelling at you is, being, is, is abusive. 
So they don't have the right to yell at you if they love you. In fact, if they loved you, they would not yell at you. That's the truth. Right? God's view of love is that love never abuses. It never abuses power. It never abuses position. It never abuses responsibility. It never abuses an individual with rage or anger or any of these other types of emotions that feel bad to be received. Love doesn't do that. Love never abuses another person. And therefore, love would never or rarely accept abuse. Now, I'm not saying that you might choose to accept abuse knowing that it's abuse. So in other words, if somebody hits me, I'm not going to hit them back and I might decide to do what I suggested in the first century, which was turn the other cheek. In other words, if they're going to hit you again, then allow that to happen as well. Now, that is not the same as what I'm stating. You see, you wouldn't continually place yourself in a situation where you're going to get abused over and over and over and over and over again. Now, many of us in human relationships have this viewpoint that love does allow abuse. That's the problem. This is where you get the battered wives syndrome from. This whole viewpoint, the guy who's hitting her is saying, I love you, I'm jealous, that's why I love you. And he's hitting her saying, don't you look at that man and don't you do this with this man and so forth. And he's doing that thinking he's being loving, but he's actually jealous and therefore not loving. Does that make sense? He is abusing and therefore not loving. And love never abuses, that's the reality. So if a person is choosing to abuse, then they are in that moment not being loving. It's quite simple. And if we're choosing to continually allow abuse to be perpetrated upon us without removing ourselves from the situation, if that's possible, then we are not being loving to ourselves either. Love would never do that. Is there any questions about that one? How's everyone feeling today? Rob, you'll feel a bit distant today. Uh, my question relates to God's law of attraction. If you're in an abusive situation, mm -hmm. um, that's not been a long-term thing. So just letting it hit you and letting it hit you and hit you just to let yourself feel the maximum One reason that. why, Robert, we are in abusive situations is because we allow abuse. So one of the things we need to deal with emotionally is why am I allowing this abuse? What belief inside of me is not loving that causes me to think that I deserve this abuse? Because the truth is that if I loved myself, I would not believe that I, de that I deserve the abuse from others. Can you see that? Yeah. Now, for many of us, we're in the situation because we've yet to learn that. We think there are certain times where abuse is acceptable. For instance, if abuse comes from my dad, then it's acceptable because he's abused me maybe a lot of my life, maybe violently, physically towards me or something like that. And then I start to believe that every time dad yells at me, that's acceptable. In other words, I'm now stating through uh, an injury that I have emotionally, I'm now stating that abuse is love, really, and that I should put up with that abuse. And many of your families have this viewpoint that families are allowed to yell at you. <laughs> like, other people aren't, but we are, because we're your family. Now, I'd put to you, if you're the family, then there should be less abuse coming from the family, not more, and that would be the most loving state. So oftentimes the law of attraction, which is a law that God's created to help expose an emotion inside of us that's out of harmony with love, is bringing abuse to us to demonstrate to us that we have an injury inside of ourselves where we do allow abuse, where we have a belief system that it is allowing of other people abusing us without us, we feel like we deserve it, in other words, with, and without us correcting it. 
And my suggestion is that if, if abuse has been a part of your life in the past or currently, the best thing we can do is to firstly deal with the issue of why we allow it. And I don't mean that you fight back against it. I mean, why don't you leave the situation rather than stay in the situation and continually allow it to happen? We, we've got to look at the emotional reason why we do that. Now, for some people, it's because they feel safe in the relationship financially. And so they stay allowing abuse to occur. For some people, it's because they feel good about the relationship sexually. And so then they allow the abuse to occur in other ways other than sexually. And we need to look at our trade-offs that we have on this matter. Love would never allow abuse, is the truth. In, in the sense that we may, we may get abused due to the law of attraction bringing us an event that, that causes our own personal abuse, but we would never continually place ourselves in the situation of getting abused over and over again without there being a major problem with our own personal definition of love. Yep. So, so if we just wait for the mic. Yep. So. It's interesting because we were having a conversation coming in the car today about abuse from parents and I was just sitting there reflecting on being tiny and having the realisation that you had no choice but to find a way to stay in that relationship and bury the abuse. Yes, mm. and this is the problem that we face as children, is if we receive any kind of abuse as a child, whether that be sexual or physical in nature or emotional in nature, we are going to begin to accept that kind of treatment from other people automatically. And one of the reasons why is because we were taught as a child that we couldn't get out of the situation. And unfortunately for many of us, when we get abused as adults, we have this belief system that we can't get out of the situation because it comes from our childhood, when the reality is we are now adults and we live in a relatively safe society, generally we can get out of the situation, but we just don't have that belief system inside of us because the fear-based belief system which was perpetrated against us as a young child has now entered us and it now becomes a part of our belief system. We, we set up a whole lot of really um, complex shutters so that we don't have to... In fact, no, I know that's a really deep problem with my emotional processing. Yes. The complexity of the shutters is so enormous. Yes. Yeah. One of those main shutters that we've set up is my mother or father smacked me but that wasn't abuse. Yeah. That's a major shutter that we yeah. shut up. So, so we, we, what we do is we tell ourselves, so here's our soul, and remember our soul's got this opening, if you like, towards a heap of false beliefs. So here's our soul. And one of those, fo one of those false beliefs is that abuse is acceptable. Acceptable. Where we will allow it. We will allow the abuse to occur. Once that belief enters our soul, now we are walking around and our emotion is actually being projected out to everyone in, you know, in this room, in the world even. And we're basically walking around saying, you can abuse me, you can abuse me and I'll accept it. That's what we're really saying. At a soul level. It doesn't matter what you act like, because many times we, act, we get angry when somebody abuses us. But our soul at the same time saying, no, you can do it. You're allowed to. Because we need to release the belief that accepted us, that, that, sorry, entered us as a child. In other words, it comes from the belief that it's okay for mummy to smack me. I will stay in the relationship. It's okay for daddy to smack me. I will stay in the relationship. And those underlying belief systems have to leave us before the new belief, which is love is never abusive, will actually enter us. So this is where, where we're now confronting our family. We're now confronting our family's acceptance of a belief system. So, so many families have this belief that it's okay to yell at your children. Well, pretty much all of us have done it at some point, right? So we all think it's okay, otherwise we wouldn't have done it. The whole of society is set up that way. Yeah. It's interesting because the shutter almost says on one side, I can't bear the truth of this situation, 
And on the other side of the shutter, it says, please do this to me. That's correct. That's correct. And because we do not want to accept the logic behind love, we often then tell ourselves very illogical things about what love is. So, for example, this, is, this demonstrates, and I've mentioned this before, the illogical thing about abuse as a child. When we become an adult and somebody comes up, comes up and hits us, we call that assault. We, we take the person generally, the police would desire us to charge the person with a criminal offence, and that person can potentially, depending on the seriousness of the offence, be jailed for that assault. That's what we call it when we're an adult. But when they're a child and they get a belting, we don't call it assault. We call that discipline. Right? Now, is that logical? As an adult, we're calling it assault. As a child, we're calling it discipline. Is that logical? Now, to me, that makes no logical sense at all. Let's call it the same. So, if, if, if somebody comes and punches you in the nose as an adult, let's call that discipline too. Or, or do the opposite. And that is, if somebody smacks their child and beats their child, then let's call that assault. We've got to do one or the other for it to be logical. Right? But what we do is we make all these compromises because we cannot face emotionally the fact that our parents assaulted us. Most of us can't face that emotionally, and so we, as a society we don't want to face that emotionally. And yet we're perfectly emotionally capable of facing the fact that when somebody comes along and smacks me in the nose as an adult, everyone in society accepts that as assault. Now that tells me there's some major problems with our society with regard to what we accept is assault. Now, either the punch in the nose as an adult is discipline or the child got assaulted. One of the two happened and we need to look at either one. Now that's not a judgement. I'm not saying a judge, that I'm not judging the parent for the reason why they've done it or anything like that. I am just stating a fact and that is that if one is called assault, the other one should also be called assault. If one is called discipline, then why isn't the other one called discipline? Right. If we could just have to wait for the mic, if that's all right, the mic's coming over. It's just that we're recording it as well. Hi. Um, I just want to know, doesn't, doesn't a parent's uh, intent when they discipline their child physically matter as well? I agree, but most one of the talks that I've given about parental discipline is often parents don't understand the underlying reason why something happens with the child. You see, one of the basic problems that we have on the planet is we believe the child has its own little independent emotional system going on. But the reality is that most children are actually reflecting the denied emotion of the parent. So if we investigate that more fully from a scientific perspective, and there is ways and methods to do that, we, we will find as a human race that if we investigate the process of what happens with children and why they choose to take certain actions, we will actually find that they take certain actions because of the denied emotion of the parent. Now to me it does not then make sense to go and smack the child for what it's only reflecting back at the parent that the parent is denying within itself. And so, and so my feelings are we need to scientifically investigate that, which we can easily do through a process of investigation like we would any other scientific technique, and we will come to discover that particular truth as a human race. And so therefore, once we discovered that truth, we would no longer desire to discipline or smack our children in particular in order to discipline or train them. We would choose other methods instead. And those other methods would be less violent and more loving to, to, to the child. My feelings are, and, and by the way, please don't feel it's a judgement because I personally have smacked my own children in the past. It's just that I've had to change on this issue as well to get to a, a different way of thinking. But my feelings are now that if we're smacking our child, we are now perpetrating violence towards the child no matter what the underlying justification is. And our child now is going to have fear enter it as a result of that particular violence. And as a result of that fear, now be open to further perpetrations of violent acts towards it 
as a result of that openness to that fear. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Do you want to get up here and talk or do you want to? What do you? <laughs> Mary's wanting to sit down and then she keeps doing this. Not good. <laughs> okay, so um, this whole idea that love allows abuse has to change on the planet. Can you see that? Because it's very opposite to a viewpoint of if I love myself, I will not continually allow a person to abuse me. I won't do that. I might do it once or twice or three times perhaps, but I won't allow it continually because if I loved myself, I would want to remove myself from that particular situation. So love never abuses nor really allows the continual act of abuse. How's this one? Love means never having to change. That's how's that for one of the world's definition of love. You see this happening a lot in, uh, in relationships as well, where a person sits down with a group of friends and they say, she's making me pick up my clothes. I've never picked up my clothes, you know, my whole life. I've only ever done it when I've had to do the washing, right? So the rest of the time I leave it on the floor. I'm allowed to keep my house messy. I'm allowed to, you know, and we justify a heap of acts that we perform and our partner at the same time is saying, no, this isn't fair. Well, I don't want this to happen anymore. You're not changing. And the guy's saying, if you loved me, you wouldn't try to change me. Which comes from a feeling of, if you love me, you'll put up with me exactly as I am, warts and all, and I don't have to change anything. Thank you very much. Now, while that might be true on the loving side, the reality is that love always results in change. Or can I call it growth? Now, now, put it this way. Imagine if for a moment you, you gave birth to a child, right? The little child's there sitting in your arms and it's, uh, and it's, and it's just a newborn babe, you know, two or three months old perhaps. And then eight years later, your neighbour comes over and you're still holding the same child <laughs> in your arms like this and it's exactly the same size as it was eight years ago. Now, would you think there's a problem? <laughs> Definitely would, wouldn't you? And, and what I put to you is it's the same with love. You see, with love, everything grows. Everything grows and becomes more, not less. It becomes more uh, beautiful, more more involved, more passionate, more understanding, more kind and considerate. And it also becomes more in terms of size, like that's the reality with love. If you nurture it, it grows. Now, if love grows, and I just might write the word grows, or grows, then it makes logical sense that that means you're going to have to change doesn't it? Because growth is change. Right? So every time we argue that we shouldn't have to change, can you see we're automatically out of harmony with love? And can you see how this is one of the problems with human relationships, how we're often complaining that the other person wants us to change, when actually the change that, we, that they're wanting us to make would probably be a good one. Right? And right the way down to picking up your clothes after you've dropped them on the floor. But right through to very severe things like, why don't you kiss me when other people are around, for example. Obviously there's a fear involved there, and if we grow, we would change. And that's the thing. Now, I'm not suggesting that you force yourself into change without changing your feelings about the matter. I'm not suggesting that. What I am suggesting is, is if your feelings were that you want to grow in love, you would not resist change. If your true feelings were that you wanted to grow in love. 
So all of, the, all of you who believe, and all of the people in the world who believe, that a relationship should not change, we've automatically got a problem, can you see? Because the relationship would change if I, were, if I and my partner were growing in love. It would automatically change, it has to. Because love results in growth, and therefore change. So my suggestion is to have a think about that one with regard to relationships. Love always results in growth. Is there any questions about that one before I move on to another? Um, I was wondering where fear entered into the human consciousness around change. Like, what did it start at the first disobedience of humankind with the first parents? Or did it start with a country fearing another country over, you know, controlling them? Or All fear generally begins with the fear of our own emotions. Right. That's where most fear generally begins. As the human race walked away from God, naturally they now became dependent upon themselves. Now, as a result of their fear, they became dependent on self. A-N-T, E-N-T, dependent on self. I'm a terrible speller, as you can see. So, so dependent on self. Now... The problem with becoming dependent on self is we no longer view our environment as an environment that will fully sustain us without ourselves being dependent upon ourselves. We don't have then this viewpoint that the universe has this unlimited resource available for us. And so we then have a feeling of lack enter us, don't we? And as the lack feeling enters us, now... Because of the lack feeling, we have fear associated with whether we're going to be able to support ourselves, have enough to eat, have enough to drink, have enough to wear, so forth. That all just starts to perpetrate itself as a cycle. So we end up getting to this point where we have so much lack in ourselves that we become addicted to a comfortable life. So what we finish up doing is we create a degree of comfort. So we work our guts out, as the saying would go, getting to have a comfortable life, and then we defend that life to the extreme. And when I say to the extreme, we will defend it even to the point of killing somebody else, many would on the planet, would kill somebody else to defend that life. So what if tomorrow somebody came along and they squatted in your house, and you came home, and all of a sudden now, You've got a whole family living in your house. And when you try to ask them to move, they get out a gun and point it at you and say, this is our house now. Now, most of us would walk away from that situation enraged, wouldn't we? And also in terrible amounts of fear. What do we do now? All of our possessions have been taken from us. All of our life has been taken from us is the viewpoint that we would have. And because of our lack... We would have all these emotions of, oh, it's taken me all my life to get this. And it's been taken from me in one event. One event. So lack, lack of love. Oh. Just say again. Lack of love. Yeah, well, so in other words, I'm, I'm so afraid that I, and because I've been dependent on myself, I'm so afraid now that nobody else can actually, so I've got to go out and recreate all of this. And that causes me to go into a defence of the lack. In other words, I am so afraid of ever having lack in the future that I'm now willing to perpetrate acts of violence even towards others in order to prevent myself from feeling the feeling of lack. And it all comes from a fear of my own emotion, a fear that I'm not going to be able to create, for example. I'm afraid that I am unable to create again. So in other words, I'm afraid of some feeling some emotions, that's all. And, and it's the fear of our emotion that causes most problems on the earth when you think about it. You, you think about war, terrorism, 
let's look at terrorism as an, as, a, as an example. Why would I perpetrate an act of violence towards another? The only reason why would because it would be because I feel something has been taken away from me. Isn't that the case? Wouldn't that be the only reason? If I feel something has been taken away from me, then I would then want to take something away from somebody else. Now, doesn't that come from a fear of feeling my own emotion? Now, imagine that your son or daughter was murdered by somebody. Now, wouldn't it, the only thing that would prevent you from actually going and wanting to murder somebody else's son or daughter, preferably the person who murdered yours, right, would be your willingness to experience your own grief. You see, if you could become willing to feel your own grief, you wouldn't need to go and harm another person's family, no matter what the underlying motive. But because we're so afraid on the planet of feeling grief to that extent, we are willing to perpetrate further acts of violence towards others in order to avoid the grief. Even if that means sticking them in jail for 30 years without any hope of being released, we'd prefer that than we would helping the person become rehabilitated. We actually, most of us on the planet, don't want the rehabilitation of a murderer. We actually want the incarceration or death of a murderer. That's the real emotion that we often feel. So, so even that comes from this fear of feeling my own emotion, my inability to fully experience my own emotion experience. It, it makes a lot of sense because with lack, you can't have growth. But with not having fear and having love, then you have growth. And you also don't have a lack anymore either. That's the irony. You see, with lack, it creates many things. It creates a de desire for defence. Right? It creates a desire for attack. You know, if something's going to be taken away from me, I'm going to take it away from you first, and that way it'll stop you from taking it away from me. You know, this whole idea in terrorism of preemptive strikes, for example, that the US government is now involved in, is all about the fear of lack. Like, what they've done is they've built up a very what they believe is a very secure, safe economy and environment for, the, for US citizens, and now they're intent on protecting that from everybody else. Our whole immigration policy in Australia is all about lack. We're all worried that if we have more people coming in, there'll be less to go around. Isn't that a fear of lack? Of course it is. Right? So, so lack causes a lot of fear and then the cycle just we're afraid of feeling the emotions of lack and that increases our fear, we become more dependent upon ourselves, we then project more lack onto our environment and we then go into this downward spiral into really dark actions, really unloving actions because we're unwilling to stop the cycle somewhere. Yeah. So these emotions that aren't love and that aren't God's definition of love were created by man, in a sense. Yeah. Um, and so well, they're created by fear, which was created by man. By man, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. fear was created by man. Well, remember, fear is false expectations appearing real. So in other words, we've, we've had enter us a whole set of untruthful beliefs. The first of which was, when you die, you're dead. That is an untruthful belief, but we now, most of the human race, believes it. And so that now perpetrates a cycle of dependence on self, lack, attack on others, not able to feel our emotions, more fear and so forth, and yeah. off it goes. So that potential for us to make those choices um, is it's, it's a lovingness from God in, in creating us with that ability to to make a choice to step away from God or to step towards God. Yeah, you're allowed to choose anything you want because of this gift of free will we've been given. But when we use our free will in fear, we are going to degrade the condition. If we use our free will in love, not fear, 
then we'll increase or improve our condition. Now, fear, you could say the opposite of fear is truth. So truth and fear are opposites, if you like. So the more I accept the truth about the universe, not just about the world, but the universe, about the soul, about how things work, everything, the more I scientifically evaluate all of this material and come to see the truth about everything, the less fear I will experience. Because fear is the false appearing real to me. And, this is, and it's fear that finishes up degrading the human race. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sort of getting more that fear is not even a real thing. I'm just sort of getting that a bit more. Like It's an emotion it's, yeah. that we need to feel. So it is real from that perspective. Yeah, it is a feeling that's inside of us yeah. that, you know, we feel quite terrified and there are very strong emotions aside, yeah. uh, with it. But unfortunately, fear, there's nothing to fear in God's universe and once we understand the truth of God's universe, we will fear nothing. But to understand the truth, it has to enter us in the same place where the fear is. Yeah. The fear is in us, has to come out, and the truth has to enter us emotionally as a feeling. And that's the problem that we face as a human race. We need to allow this fear to be released without acting upon it, and we need to allow the truth to enter us, and now we act upon that and what the truth dictates. Yeah. So, so, for example, we can bring many examples into this, but one example is many of us do not realise how strong still within us is the fear of violence. The fear of personal violence is very strong in the human race. Now, that fear of personal violence mostly exists because we're afraid that when we die, we're dead, and therefore... There is no chance of life afterwards. We're going to lose all sense of happiness, all sense of fulfilment, not even know ourselves anymore. Many people feel that, right? Or, if it's more of a religious viewpoint, a lot of the fear is, oh, if I've been a bad person, I'll go to hell anyway. So a lot of people are afraid of where they're going to end up if there is an afterlife, right? Now, once we know the truth, and the truth is, and we can state it, but that's no good, we can state this truth, and the truth is that you have the ability to continue growing for the rest of your existence whether you lose your physical body or not. That's the truth. But that truth has to be inside of me emotionally before it's going to change my actions. Can you see? While it's just a thought, I'm still going to react to situations that are violent in a violent manner. It's only going to be when it's a feeling in me Ah, oh, I don't need, it's a relaxed feeling, I don't need to react to any violent situation. Because in the end of the day, it's, I'm just going to change in terms of my dimensional existence and I'll be in another location with the ability to continue growing. Nothing to fear. I have nothing to fear. And, and in fact, fear, we start learning that fear is the only thing that causes pain. Now, I've described this to many of you already as well, how I've been through a situation myself where when I was afraid of it, I had extreme amounts of pain. And then once I got through that psychological barrier of the fear itself, the pain disappeared completely and all of a sudden it felt pleasant. The, the thing that felt painful before actually felt pleasant just by going through that psychological bar barrier of fear. Fear creates the pain in our body and in our life. So it's very important to understand that the world's definition of love is really the fear. It's really based around fear, ideas of fear. If we just have a mic over there. And it's very important for us to understand that, that, that this is the case. Hi, how are you going? Um, my, Michael's my name. No, um, Michael. I just was, I, I totally agree with everything I've heard you say so far and I yep. was thinking of a more complex scenario, perhaps uh, like drug use, mm -hmm. where it um, introduces a lot of fear to a lot of people, but uh, if the individual per se is not otherwise demonstrating anything but love, how do you suggest society applies their views to that? Um, I agree that a lot of the judgments of society about drug use 
And in fact, a lot of the judgments of society about all sorts of things are actually based on fear, their own fears of that particular thing. So let's look at, say, the use of drugs as an example, right? We need to look again at the reality of drugs compared to the fear-based reactions towards drugs. So the fear-based reaction that most of humanity has towards drugs is what? What would you say? Sorry? They're saying Stay don't away. do it. Yeah, I agree. But why? Because it's going to be detrimental to your ability to love others. Okay, so it'll be detrimental to your physical health is one thing. Your emotional well-being is another. Being is another. And potentially, many people feel, will cause your death. That's how most of society feels, isn't it, generally? So you're out of control, somebody mentioned, Raj? Yeah, so, so no control. And society has a huge problem with control, of course. So that's, uh, we've got to all be in control, emotionally and every other way. So, so that's the society's viewpoint. Now, if we just take away all of those viewpoints without looking at the potential of the truth about drugs, we would then be perhaps justified in saying, well, we can take drugs, there's no problems with it, right? But let's also, we need to also, that's the fear about drugs, but what is the truth about drugs? And it depends, now it depends on what type of drug, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yes. And, and, and that's my view, is that... Um is that we, again, it's a very similar issue to, to um, di corporal discipline, as you were saying earlier. Yeah. Um, it's okay for us to apply drugs in a social context, but then in another context, we decide, no, it's not. And in well, let's, a even respects, go, let's even go further than that. It's okay to apply drugs in a health context. Absolutely. Like you can go to the doctor and buy a drug. Yeah, that's right. And that's okay. Yeah, and, and a lot of the time, uh, what we might say is the truth uh, when we really explore the issue and the physical impacts, which uh, seems a lot of those fears tie back to, yep. um, was that, again, was this whole notion seems to be sort of transcending the physical a little bit in that we're trying to explore a state that allows us to understand that we can continue to grow even beyond our physical being. So I agree, but I would put to you, though, that it would make also logical sense that the only reason why we turn to substances in order to explore is because we're afraid of exploring without the substances. Absolutely. And I feel like that one of the primary fears that we have in the society is that we're so afraid of emotion and we're so afraid of truth that the only time we'll go and discover it is if we're under some kind of influence of some kind of substance, like alcohol, drugs and so forth. Now, for, if we look at the issue of alcohol, for example, alcohol causes huge amounts of problems on our planet, does it not? Absolutely. But is it alcohol that causes it, or is it the suppression of emotion that occurs that causes a person to feel attracted to alcohol? I, I, I incline to agree with the latter, and, mm. and thus, in some respects, think that uh, the, the social structure which, sort of said, which promotes a, a mental culture of... Um, this is okay, that's not okay, why? Because I said so, um, is not one that's going to reveal the truth. Exactly, and it's also not a structure that's based on love. Absolutely. Because a structure based on love allows exploration. It doesn't mean that I have to do it personally, but it allows exploration as long as the results of that exploration are more loving. Absolutely. Uh, that's what it would do. So the truth about drugs, let's have a look at some of the truths. Now, some drugs are very dangerous, are they not? Yeah. Yeah, so some are. So the, there is a danger, the reality is there is a danger of death. Right? What is the reason, reason why most people take drugs? To escape. Or avoid. I would say that that's part of the social stigma really because um, I don't, I've never really met a person who therefore then hasn't attempted to escape or avoid. Uh, we're all here. I would say it's more... Uh, um, uh, now, what I'm suggesting, Michael, is that if, I, if society you know, as a whole didn't have this general mentality that we need to avoid our emotions, yeah. 
and avoid our life experiences and get away from the terrible emotions we sometimes feel, then society would be less given to wanting to take drugs. My view is more that it's the same drive that drives education and the desire to learn in the first place. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think there'd be far more factors myself than that. Oh, but, to, to yeah. varying degrees, obviously, yeah. depending on everything. But. See, I, I would also argue that um, what happens with many drugs is there is this tendency inside of us to, to attach to the drug because we are trying to go for an experience that we're not normally having. Now, my question would be, why aren't we normally having it? Um, I met some spirits the other day, we were talking to some spirits a few weeks ago, who were drug users on the earth and they had passed into the spirit world. And they, um, we, we talked to them about receiving love. And once they started receiving love from God, one of the comments they made was, this is better than any drug. <laughs> right? And my feeling is a lot of times we turn to drugs because there is a lack of love in our lives, uh, in either in relationships or in our relationship with God. My view is more that um, we strive to want to learn things. Uh, we actually self-inflict this state of fear because our comfort zone becomes comfortable and, and the desire to want to learn dr drives us to want to make choices to explore new things. Yep. Um, a lot of that is moving away from a physical exploration to a mental exploration, so there's an increasing desire to want to explore in particular things that will increase a cognitive state, which yep. is any, anything from books to, to taking drugs. And to that, spirituality, to all sorts absolutely. of things. Absolutely. Yep. And I agree, but I feel, again, that we are capable of doing that exploration in a society that doesn't have to take drugs in order to perform that exploration. So, so the, but I also feel that I don't understand why society generally um, punishes the taking of drugs. Because that creates in itself a whole gr slew yeah. of criminal activities Absolutely. and therefore a whole slew of environmental and economic impacts that would not normally be created. Similar to the corporal punishment discipline cycle that you would see mm. of smacking a child. But my personal view is that any time I take something that actually alters my body's state, I am actually prohibiting my body from more easily absorbing truth and love. So, so for that reason, I personally do not take drugs of any kind, um, even ones prescribed by a doctor generally. Um, because I feel that it does alter the state of truth and love within the, within the soul of the individual. And I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with your approach there because it's consistent. Yep. I, just, I, I really only brought up the issue because I think it's a glaringly inconsistent one in society that's it is. promoting this psychosis. Yeah, it is. There are many glaring inconsistencies in society and any inconsistency in society is illogical and therefore must be unloving and we need to examine it from a loving perspective, I agree. Yeah. And the problem with many debates about such matters is that there is not an acknowledgement of the inconsistencies. There's not an acknowledgement of the fact that on one hand we're saying one thing is true, on the other hand we're saying the other thing is true. Just like the earlier example I gave of smacking a child is discipline, hitting an adult is assault. And there's a glaring inconsistency. Yeah. And therefore it's illogical, therefore it's unloving. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, Lewis is my name. Sorry, I didn't introduce no worries, myself Lewis. before. Yeah. Um, just talking about, um, I've, I've had a thought recently that um, the use of illicit drugs in a, uh, in a controlled context, um, namely through uh, psychiatrists or whatever, so that society feels comfortable with yep. the idea, yep. um, you know, illicit drug use on a, on a small and controlled scale could perhaps give people an idea of what their mind is capable of uh, with, without the drugs? Yeah, there was a man um, <coughs> named Terence McKenna. Have you ever heard of him, Lewis? Like, there's this guy, anyway, he was a scientist uh, who's now passed. He passed, actually, for, uh, I'm not certain how he passed, but... Uh, sorry? A brain... Um, a tumour, that's right. That's right, that's how he passed. Um, 
But he, um, he believed, in fact, he felt he received, through the use of illicit drugs, through psychotropic drugs, um, many of the truths of the universe that he then defined scientifically. And I agree that he did, but it wasn't because of the use of drugs. It was because the use of a drug connected him to some spirits who then could transmit to him information that he wasn't otherwise transmitting when he was in his normal state. And the reality is he could have talked to those spirits in an uninduced or undrugged state uh, as well as he could have in a drug state. But because of society's problems with that and the, the viewpoint that that is a you know, crazy thing to do and, and is often viewed crazy, um, he, he couldn't do that and instead he went towards the psychotropics. So my feeling with a lot of this information about drugs and so forth is, is all about... I feel that if you, if you maintain your pure state emotionally, physically, mentally and you maintain a state of desire, passion and longing and you are in a state of, in state of love, you will not need additional substances to, to help you with your life or the exploration of your life. I feel we often then uh, feel attracted to substances to explore our life because of the denial of those other factors the denial of, of, of the lack of love primarily yeah, I, I in our life. You need to use the microphone, sir. Yeah, I, I think what illicit drugs do is uh, give people a, a brief moment of um, escapism from those emotional barriers. I agree, but then I would say to you, wouldn't it be better to have a permanent esta state of escapism from those barriers than a temporary one? And, if, and what I'm discussing with the audience is... Well, I, I agree, which is why I'm personally... I've, I've never consumed alcohol or illicit drugs. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I've figured out a lot of what you're, what you're saying now. But, yeah, um, yeah there's a, you know, time, time is of the essence, you know. We're, we're, we're on the brink of something disastrous happening. Yeah. If illicit drugs could be used safely in an... In in a safe context to give people a, a brief glimpse of what their mind is capable of and then apply, apply like your philosophies to it. But, but, in, but Lewis, the statement you just made was a statement of fear because you're saying time is off the essence. It, the reality is you have a, an everlasting life, so time is not of the essence. There is no... Well, fear can give you a sense of urgency though, couldn't it? Yeah, but, but the problem is urgency based on fear is not love. It's based on fear and so therefore it's based on untruth. And this is what I'm trying to get across, is that anything that's based on fear is the world's definition of love, but it's not God's definition of love. It's not the truth about love. Anything based on truth is what's going to be loving. So, so if I'm worried that the world's going to end tomorrow or next week or next month or next year, like... Um, then, then fear is dominating my behaviour, not truth. Because the truth is, no matter what happens with the world, I have an eternal existence. And so therefore I have nothing to fear. And therefore I have, a, I have an unlimited amount of time to investigate life. So I don't need to do it in a hurry if I don't want to. You can, but you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can't there be a fine line on how people perceive fear? Like fear is, um, could be, you know, like, like I said, it might give you a sense of urgency. Um, isn't, it, isn't it all about perception? Well, we see... Is it, if, it fear, if, if fear, like the, the sense of urgency that it gives you, drives you towards loving acts. But I'm saying that that's impossible. What I'm stating, and I have been stating for years now, is that it's impossible to use as a justification a fear-based explanation to become more loving. This oh, is I tend to agree on, on society's general definition of fear. or what. You but, know, but, but you're saying if fear creates a sense of urgency, then it's helpful. And I'm saying if it's fear that creates the urgency, then it's not helpful. If truth creates the urgency, then it's helpful. Can you see the different underlying motivation? Can't, can't it be true to sometimes be afraid of things? Sorry, can't it be? Can't it be true to sometimes be afraid of things? Isn't that natural? No, what I'm saying is that it's not natural. Our normal state is to be afraid of nothing. 
nothing at all, including death. That is our normal state. If truth or love creates urgency, then that's fantastic. So in other words, if I, if I notice Mary, my girl on the opposite side of the room, and I feel an instant urge to go up and give her a hug, and I feel really so urgent that I'm willing to avoid my conversation with you in order to do that. Go right, <laughs> right. on ahead. Then love, <laughs> then love creates my urgency, and so therefore there's always going to be a positive result. Do you understand? Is but, it, is it, wouldn't there still be in the back of your mind a little bit of fear that if you didn't do that right at that moment, that, um, you know... She, she might get upset with me? Yes. Well, that, now fear is creating my urgency, and it's not an act of love anymore. It's all, it's all about how you perceive that fear, though, isn't it? No, it's not. It's about whether the fear exists or not. If the fear exists within me, in other words, if I look at Mary's face and I can see, yeah, she wants me to come and give her a hug right now, and if I don't do it, she's going to punish me later, right? There's going to be no sex for a week if, <laughs> if that happens, right? If that's what I feel. Now it's not love driving my action. It's my fear of no sex for a week that's driving my action. Does that make sense? Now, guys... We're off topic now, and I'd like to get on topic. What drives the law of attraction? I'm saying is that fear is often what drives the law of attraction. We're attracted to things we're afraid of to reconcile them and make them things we are no longer afraid of. I agree with that statement to, perfectly. Yep, I do agree that often it's the unhealed emotion in us that it draws an event to us that causes us then to confront it, but we need to confront any fear-based event with truth. That's the, that's the key. So if, so if I'm in an interaction with Mary and I'm acting out of fear because I'm afraid she might do something if I don't do it, if I don't take an action, then, then it's not love anymore that's driving my action. It's fear. And the only results can be bad, basically, is what I'm saying. Whereas if love is driving my action, in other words, it's desire, passion, longing, there now... Love is driving my urgent action. So, for example, if we took it from a, in a world context, let's put an urgent action in the world context. 50 million children die every single year of starvation. Now, to me, that lo love would dictate an urgent action. Would it not? Yes? Love would dictate an urgent action. But what do we do? We arm and are and we, you know, you know people are still... Umming and ahhing, years and years of this has been years and years of 50 million children dying every year of malnutrition. And we're still umming and ahhing because f f when fear drives the action, the problem is it just depends on which fear is the highest as to which one wins. Right? Whereas when love drives the action, love is always the winner. And this is the thing we need to bear in mind. The problem for the world is that we are often just trading one fear for another, for another, for another. And whatever fear is the greatest is the fear that dictates my life. So in, in my case with Mary, let's say, if I, if I go to give her a hug, but then I can feel in Mary that she actually doesn't want me to hug her at all, now fear is dictating my action and not my love dictating the action. And now I'm afraid of rejection, afraid of disapproval, afraid of now... Or what I'm saying is now that these fears are in place, I, can never, I will never have a good relationship with Mary while those fears are in place. There will never be... My human relationship, my relationship with another person is never going to be based upon love and will never grow in that place. But as soon as my actions are based on truth and love, every single interaction has a chance for growth. And that might mean urgency, I agree, Truth can create urgency, but in fact I feel truth should create more urgency than fear ever would. So the fact that 50 million children die every year should create within us an urgency to resolve this problem from a, from a world perspective. It hasn't because fear dominates man and everyone wants to have a slice of the pie, everyone is too afraid to take action in countries, you know, everyone's too afraid to have those 50 million people come to Australia. I'd personally be okay with 50 million people coming to Australia if they were all children dying of malnutrition. I don't know about you. And I'm sure that economically we could create a means to support them somehow. That's my feelings. Um, many of us have four or five children in our families and we seem to support them fine. 
So, you know, I, I just feel there is a way to fix these problems. But when fear dominates it, fear of lack kicks in. I go, no, if we have 50 million people come here who have all in malnutrition, you know, what are we going to do with them? Who's going to look after them? And we start now worrying about all the details too so much rather than actually acting upon love. Now we have a different result. Yeah. So let's move on. Let's look at this one. That's a pretty common belief, isn't it? Yeah. Love is jealous. And all you need to do to get God's point of view here is just add a never. Okay. This is very confronting belief in relationships that love is never jealous. We, we sometimes want to hold on to the concept that love is jealous because it means I love you. That, that, that's proof that I love you, that I'm jealous. And we even see this in movies, don't you, where somebody's jealous and oh, that means he loves her. That means he loves her because he's jealous. Jealousy comes from all sorts of emotions. But in particular, again, it, came, it comes from the emotion of lack in that I will not have enough from you if I'm jealous of you spending your time with somebody else. It means that I won't have enough. Now, jealousy, there are lots of causes of jealousy and I won't go into them today, but what I'm saying is that love is never jealous. Love doesn't have the feeling in it that somebody else shouldn't do or shouldn't take an action just because they love you. Right? That's, that's the reality about love. Jealousy comes from emotions of lack and so therefore come from, comes from emotions of fear. And of course, fear is never loving. Does that make sense? Yep. So love is actually never jealous. And if somebody is jealous, they are actually afraid. And if they're afraid, there might be a good reason why they're afraid or no reason at all. Now, can I get, when I say no reason at all, let's be more specific. A person may become fearful of the relationship. Right? So imagine, imagine you're walking down the street, going to get lunch, from your lunchtime at work. And you're walking down the street and you just decide, oh, I think I'll go around the corner and go to a place to buy some lunch that I've never been to before. You turn the corner and right there, over in the in distance a bit, you see your wife or your partner kissing another man. Now, what I'm saying is that love is never jealous. So... If we were love, we'd be able to look at that without any jealousy. Now that's a pretty challenging idea, isn't it, and concept. How many of us would feel that at this point, right? Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> lips or the cheek? Yeah, that's the first question we ask. Yeah, lips or the cheek. Kiss on the lips. Right? Like this. <laughs> you know, like... So in other words, in a passionate embrace, yeah? So, uh, so... There they are in a passion and embrace. And what would be the normal response for the average person on the planet? Well, no, you see. See, we've got to trace the response. We've got to trace the response because the normal response is all triggered about a fear, not the rage comes from a fear. So what's the fear? I'm going to, I've lost her. And I don't want to feel my emotions of loss. I don't want to grieve the potential of losing this relationship of a person that I feel I love. And so because I'm afraid of dealing with my own emotions of loss and afraid of losing the relationship because I'm afraid of my own emotions, the next step I take 
is one of many times anger. And anger can even be so angry that it becomes rageful and it can even become so enraged that it becomes resentful. Right? Which is long-term rage sitting inside of you. Right? Now, if I was comfortable feeling my emotion of grief about the potential loss of the relationship, then I would never get to anger, rage or resentment in the situation, for a start. But secondly, the jealous feeling that I have, which is actually anger or rage about the event that I'm observing, comes from my own fear of loss inside of myself. Whereas if I wasn't afraid of loss, I'd probably just wander up to them, say, just tap her on the shoulder, and say, uh, what's going on here? <laughs> I thought we were in a relationship. <laughs> and you're now in a relationship with somebody else, what would I do? Can you see, I might still love the person, but I, I would see immediately that from a love perspective, the relationship really has been terminated in that moment. And if I am prepared to feel my grief, I would be able to feel my grief, if I had, if I had grief to feel, I'd be able to feel my grief without going into the jealousy without going into the rage, right? So the reality is that love is never really jealous if it's really love. Jealousy is anger, is caused by anger about not being able to feel your grief of loss. And so therefore, it's fear of the grief of loss and therefore, it is not loving because it's fear-based, it's not truth-based. Whereas the love is never jealous, so a person who is in love would be able to walk straight up to them in that situation, tap on the shoulder, say, what's happening here? Can we have a chat about it? And be able to have the chat without becoming enraged, without even being angry, but would be quite firm, would they not? In that, hang on a sec, you're in a relationship with another person, therefore you're not in a relationship with me, Therefore, I think we need to separate straight away until you work out what you want. It would make sense, wouldn't it, to do that? But the world's viewpoint is, no, that means, if a person can do that, that means they, did, they didn't love them in the first place. It's me, is it? And, and often what happens then is we go down this track of, oh, if they weren't jealous, and in fact, we even have people trying to make a person jealous in order to prove that they love them, right? Or that they've loved. And if you're trying to make somebody jealous, I put to you that that is also not loving because you're trying to make somebody else angry rather than feel their own grief about your lack of fidelity. So that's another truth about love. Now, what we're going to do now is have a break for about 45 minutes.